Welcome back to the Minikime Show featuring Lenny, the second edition of the War Room Mock Draft. I am so excited for this one. Love Danny Kelly, but I'm a Greg head. I'm a huge <laughs> fan of Greg McElroy's podcast, Always College Football. I especially love listening to it this last year, Greg, because my Washington Huskies were so fun to watch. Uh, if you were subscribed to this, seriously subscribe to that. Watch it on YouTube. It is, Greg, it, my, one of my favorite podcasts. Well, I appreciate it. And I also appreciate very much like early on in the season last year, we said that that Washington team were giving me some serious 2019 LSU vibes and you were like all pumped about it. And then sure enough, we fast forward like four or five weeks. I think Spears was saying it. Booger McFarlane was saying it's like, what? Ha we came up with that. You and I, not them. You and I, right? Goodness you gracious. Know, the LSU guys were like, how dare you compare them? <laughs> yeah, right. Of course. But it ended up being true. It really, by the way, is very true, too. As we look at this draft, we're going to talk about quite a few Huskies uh, in the first round. It, it, it is a, was a remarkable group of players. Uh, and I'm excited to get into it. So just to remind folks of the premise and how this works, uh, we are doing a full first round. We are a war room. So... I'm the GM, you're the head coach, you're the GM, I'm the head coach. We're working together on this. I am going to pick two players for every team, and then you choose the player that you like and tell us why. Uh, and this is not a prediction. It is not what I think will happen. There are no trades. It's what we would do. So it's a great way right. for us to just talk about the players that we like. Um, yeah. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So with the first pick, dun, 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 not a lot of drama in this one in real life, but... For this exercise, I am giving you two choices. It's the Chicago Bears. One of those choices, his pro day is happening right now. Um, <laughs> so uh, da -da -da -da, I'm giving you Caleb Williams and Drake May. Not a consensus universal pick right now. A lot of people have Jane Daniels there. Right. These are my two choices, Greg. Who are you going to take? Totally good with both. Um, have called both their games. I personally... Right now, with where we're at and rookie contracts and stuff, like I want the boomer bust prospect. Like I want to find the next Mahomes. So if I'm drafting top of the draft, I'm not that interested in trying to find a guy that's like, all right, he's going to be steady. He's going to be Kirk Cousins. Like I don't want to find that guy. I want to find the Mahomes. And if he's not Mahomes, fine. We'll fast forward a couple years and we'll do it all over again. Um, I'm going Caleb Williams. I think he's got the highest ceiling in the draft. The one thing that concerns me, though, Mina, having covered guys and just gotten to know personality characteristics and personality traits, guys that come in with the chip on their shoulder, the mm. Joe Burrows of the world, guys that come in like that, like I'm going to prove everybody wrong, they are the ones that I kind of want to bet on. The mm. guys that, that come in being told they're the greatest thing ever for the last three years, they concern me. And Caleb Williams has been told how great he is. He's talked about it, getting equity in the team that drafts him. Now, is that his team or is that him? I don't know. But ultimately, I think he's the most talented player. And I think he's a guy that can completely elevate a franchise if things set up the way they could potentially set up in Chicago. He is set up well. Uh, last week I talked this about this with Dan Orlowski. I think what I love the most about Caleb Williams is the situation that he's being put in in Chicago. They've made a, a bunch of changes there. It is, uh, I think, n night and day from USC. That was my biggest takeaway watching Williams tape. I didn't know how bad he had it at USC this past year. Uh, so I like the pick. Uh, I don't know what you're going to do it too because I I am not I I don't know what your quarterback rankings are. Right. So I am legitimately excited to find out. <laughs> with you're the commanders with the number two pick, whether you're going to take May, who I'm leaving on my board, right, or LSU's Jaden Daniels. Uh, I'm going Jaden Daniels, and Woo! and it's comparable to the conversation we just had. Like I like the boomer bust prospect, and I look at Jaden Daniels' deep ball accuracy and the amount of times he's forced to throw the ball 30 yards or more down the field, and the amount of times he had to do it against good coverage and drop it in a bucket by a yard. And he did it over and over and over again. And you look at his supporting cast too, and that's that's tricky. Right. When his receivers and neighbors and Thomas and the guys that we'll be talking about, I mean, they're amazing. They're elite. But I look at the ball placement. It was just another level. And I also look at the progression. Right. I mean, where he was at Arizona State, big leap his first year at LSU, huge leap his last year. I just feel like he's on a really nice trajectory to get where you want him to go. Um, I also think the other thing that people have kind of been concerned about, which I am, too, he's an upright runner. That's a straight line speed track guy. Like that is concerning straight line speed track guy. He's got some wiggle, but he doesn't need to take the hits he took in the sec. I mean, he got knocked out of the Alabama game. He's gotten hit 
a lot and he's an upright runner. So if he can learn to take care of his body, feel great about it. Yeah. The, the frame and the upright running style are, are probably one of my biggest concerns. Sure. Um, I joked about this on Twitter. He really, it is like Wile E. Coyote out there sometimes <laughs> where like it, the po- clip I posted was when he tried to hurdle, uh, the, it, it was from the beginning of the year against FSU and he did get better at it, but right. Still some pretty bad hits. It's why, by the way, like the Lamar Jackson comps don't make any sense. Like as his running style is so different from Jackson. <laughs> yeah. Love the player though. Uh, amazing <laughs> arm. Uh, definitely incredible mobility. Just needs to be harnessed correctly. Okay, so that takes us to the Patriots. Right. So I want to explain. I want to make this a little bit trickier for you. Leaving May on the board, and this is where I'm introducing Marvin Harrison Jr. Right. Uh, so the case against May. Well, you, you know, regardless of who he has a prospect, is if you look at this Patriots team and you think, oh my God, they really, it's a bad situation for a quarterback. We just saw Bryce Young go through something similar in Carolina. Right. This is a very, like a substandard receiver group, offensive line is issues. So could there be a case made that they take one of these blue chip wide receivers instead, maybe take a quarterback later or punt a year? Or if you're there, do you just take Drake May? So I think you take Drake May because I do think the gap between Drake May and JJ McCarthy, next man up, is sizable. Great. And I look at the gap between Marvin Harrison and what you might be able to get a little deeper in the draft at wide receiver, and I don't think that gap is that significant. Now, I think Drake May is a really, really good player. I think people have already seen people say he's not a great athlete. He's not this. I think he's a really good athlete. He's such a good athlete. Who's <laughs> saying that? What? He's not Lamar. All right, fine. Okay, if if Lamar is the only athlete in the NFL, cool. Like, all right, he's not an athlete then. Fine. I think he moves perfectly fine. One thing I've, I noticed with him when I'm watching him in shorts, Mina, you watch him before a game, it's kind of unimpressive. You know, not in, not in a, you, you watch him, it's like, all right, I kind of wish there was a little more juice on the ball. I kind of wish the, you know, I kind of wish the ball had a little bit more, you know, up and down. I wish it just, there were such some things and the, maybe the sp- spiral was a little tighter. And then I kind of watch him in the game. It's like, wow, all right, never mind. You know what I mean? And the same feeling I had with Joe Burrow. Like you watch Joe Burrow in shorts or at practice, you're like, uh, he's, he's fine. You know, yeah. good player, but not, you know, he's not Joe Milton who is ridiculous. You know what I mean? So I, I think Drake May is one of those guys that's a gamer. The problem is the last four games of each of his first two years as a starter, major drop off down the stretch. And I also don't think he does a great job in the pocket and feeling the rush. I think he sees the rush from time to time, and that's a little bit of an issue too. But I still think he's got a high ceiling, and I think he's a great kid, and I think he's going to work his tail off to get where he wants to go. Pocket management is probably my biggest question occasionally spotty accuracy but i think in terms of like you talked at the beginning about wanting the mahomes upside i really see a lot of that in may i i think like the second reaction ability some of the throws he makes are really really impressive he creates on his own and and by the way i mean i said holy smokes terrible offense (laughs) i this is the part where you know the nfl person comes in or come rattling in and i'm like uh very critical of college but like oh my god the drops some of the concepts did not love okay so unc drake goes to the pats so we went quarterbacks one two three so i think everybody believes one of these two players this is another one where i'm genuinely excited to see what you have to say pretty much everyone thinks harrison jr neighbors at four cardinals uh Harrison Jr. was like chalk as wide receiver one for so much of the year. And then sure. that has changed. And now I am seeing <laughs> boards that have neighbors moving up or hearing rumors about neighbors. Greg, who would you take if you were the Arizona Cardinals? Well, neighbors has a ton of juice and there's reasonable comparisons to Jamar Chase. And I don't think he's got quite the length that Chase does, but he could play inside and out. Like he's really good. It's still, it's still Marvin Harrison um, for me. Uh, he's a, he's a bit of a unicorn. I do think that there were some concerns with me about overall straight line speed. Uh, he's, he's really more of a possession guy, which people take that as like a slight Mina to me. That's not a slight. The guy's uber productive. He was seen on multiple occasions, him taking over the game against quality competition. And I think he's physical enough to be able to win in those contested catch situations. Now, I actually wouldn't even have neighbors as the two receiver. We'll get to that in a moment. But uh, I think Marvin Harrison is the one, but I think he's 1A to who my quote number two receiver is 1B. Like those two are the coin flip to me. Wow. 
Okay, well, um, then I'm going to get spicy at five, <laughs> knowing that, a piece of information. So the Chargers, when I did this uh, draft last time, um, had not traded Keenan Allen, right. cut Mike Williams. Right now, this is probably the worst group of receivers in the NFL. So I'm going to give you two to choose from, setting you up to make your uh, <laughs> spicy pick here. Sounds good. We keep, we keep neighbors on the board. We throw in you. Uh, although I guess you could be like, no, actually, it was A.D. Mitchell. I'm assuming you're talking about Roma Dunze, who I am right. putting on the board at five. 100%. Uh, and like, I thought you might like go a major curveball. Like, oh, wait, hang on. There's a trade. You know, here we go. We got Chargers jumping up, jumping down, that. and the Vikings jumping up, going to get a quarterback. I don't. I didn't know where you're going with that, but uh, knowing where you're going, I'll take Roma Dunze. Um, nobody had more contested catches in college football last year than Roma Dunze, and he got plenty of opportunities. But if you look at his contested catch rate, it's still pretty outrageous. And he had to do so at times, knowing that he was getting bracket coverage. One, you sit down and just talk with him for five seconds you're going to fall in love with the kid. Like absolutely, totally enamored with the person. Um, at a position like that, I want a guy that is like first class. Hey, give me the ball when you want to. Fine, no problem. That's good. Like granted, every receiver's got a hint of diva. No problem with that. But at the same point, man, this guy's just the real deal. He's big too. Like I was surprised Thanks. to see just how well he's going to run just because yes. he's, he's a huge dude. And I thought he was actually a little taller. I think he's like six, two, seven, eights or whatnot at the combine. Like I thought he had a little more length than that. Man, he plays bigger than that. Uh, I think he's a, I think he's a star in the NFL. I really believe it. Yeah. He tested really well at the combine, which I think if there's a question about Dunze and there's a reason why most people have him as wide receiver three, it's the athleticism and the, you know, after the catch, the straight sure. line speed compared to these other two guys. But I just don't see a world in which he's not really good at the NFL. Right. You know what I mean? Like the floor 100%. to me, he maybe has the highest floor of any player in the, like just watching him. Um, and it would be interesting for, you know, the chargers. He's not, he's, he's different from Keenan Allen, but there's some similarities there. Sure. Um, yeah. I, I saw a comp, somebody compared him to AJ green and, uh, I was texting with uh, Daniel Jeremiah about this. Uh, people on Twitter were like, that's insulting. And I was like, do you guys remember? Uh, anyways. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think he's Devontae Adams. Like, I, that's who I think he's a, he's a sound route runner. He plays huge. He's not going to, like, blow you away with his straight line speed. But I look, everyone wants a Tyreek. Everyone wants a Waddle. You know, everyone wants a catch and run guy that can make you miss and take it the distance. And look, Justin Jefferson's the best slot guy going, like, no doubt. Um, but to me, like he is just a typical X that, you know, where you're going to get, like, you're going to get predictable productivity and he's going to get you 120 catches a year. I mean, he's just going to be steady Eddie, never going to get hurt because of how big and durable he is. Like, I love the guy. Arguably a harder skill set to find than speed, um, <laughs> is what you're describing. So we'll keep speed on the board. We've got the giants at six. Um, real life, I think this could be a JJ McCarthy spot, but not in my draft. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm leaving neighbors as an option. This is a Giants team that obviously needs help at receiver. They also need offensive line help, though, outside of Andrew Thomas at left tackle. It's just been a huge issue on this team. So I put up Joe Alt, uh, the tackle out of Notre Dame. Are you going to go neighbors or Alt here? Uh, I'll go neighbors here. Um, just a last chance here to take a peek at what you got at quarterback, right? Like, I mean, if there's one thing we've learned, you got to have weapons. We've seen that a million examples. Like, look at what Tua did when you add Tyreek. You look at the other guys' production that have jumped when they've added a legit wide receiver. I mean, we've seen it all over the place for a very long time. So, I mean, Jamar Chase, when he got to Cincinnati, I mean, just how much better Burrow got after that. And they opted to pass on the tackle that year, even though their offensive line was awful. Went with Jamar Chase to go to the Super Bowl. So, I think right now, with where receivers gone, it's a premier position as much as left tackle. So I would take neighbors here, knowing the juice that you're going to get after the catch and and the sudden separation he can create at the slot or on the outside if you want him there. I think Giants fans would be thrilled with that. All right, seven. <laughs> uh, this is one of the easiest positions in the draft. I think everyone knows the Titans are going to take a tackle. The <laughs> they, they went out and paid Calvin Ridley, which made because you know the receiver was a possibility. Now I think um, tackle is obvious. So. And this whole offensive line is, I mean, they added some pieces on the interior, but they need a left tackle. I left Joe Alt up and I added Olu Fashano, which is interesting because I feel like going into the college football season, uh, he was thought of as the number one tackle prospect. And then since then, and I think his draft season has gone up, I've seen him dropping down boards. I've yeah. seen Fuaga, who I alluded to, was a right tackle at Oregon State. Right. Even uh, Trey Fatanu out of Washington, Utah. But I'm, I'm keeping Olu up. 
because I want someone for Tennessee who can walk in and start left tackle right away. Uh, and I think both him and Alt fit the bill. I think Olu is really athletic. Um, the problem is, I, I don't think he's a grind. I don't think he's just a complete road grading grinder. And look, your left tackle doesn't necessarily have to be that. Um, but I look at Alt, man, and I think while his pass pro is at times a little hit or miss, uh, I think he gets plays a great pad level. I think you could play him at right or left if you wanted. I mean, I think he's you could play either side. I think he probably projects a little better as a left. But I look at some of the things they asked him to do. I mean, Mina, they're pulling him. They're they're he's a lead blocker on counters. Like they're doing all kinds of stuff with him that they don't ask tackles to do very often in college. Usually pulling and leading on powers and counters, that's really up to the guard because they're a little more athletic and your tackles a big lumbering guy. Not with Joe Alton. For a guy that's six seven to play with that level of pads, he's not really a backbender. He's got good flexibility. Like I like Joe Alton a lot. Plus, I like the system. I mean, how many great offensive tackles yeah. and offensive linemen in general have we seen from Notre Dame over the years? The Falcons uh, are in a good spot because they need defense. I have cornerback and edge as their biggest needs, and I think this is probably going to be the first defensive pick taken if they do go defense. I'm giving you two options. I'm bringing them both from the same school. I got <laughs> Dallas Turner and Terry and Arnold, uh, who I have as my edge one and corner one in this class. So I am letting you, this is, of course, the area of expertise for you, uh, pick which of these players would you like? Yeah, I mean, both the good options. Um, I would lean towards the edge defender uh, in, in Dallas Turner, um, partly because I look at the, at the conference and uh, the division a little bit, like which passing game is really freaking you out. Um, you know, <laughs> I guess yeah. you could say with what Tampa might look like in the future, they still have some headaches that you got to deal with, but... If I can find a guy that can affect the quarterback and get home, uh, I'm going Dallas Turner. And and while I love Terran Arnold and has, I mean, I'm so proud of the growth he's experienced in the last year. I mean, the guy wasn't even a bona fide starter a year ago at yeah. this point. Uh, they actually went to the portal trying to get a guy to maybe replace Terry on Arnold. Uh, and ultimately Terry on holds on and becomes by far uh, their best cover guy last year. So I'm real proud of the growth he's made, but I have to go. I absolutely have to go with Dallas Turner there. But uh, I'll tell you what, Jared Verse to me makes a real good argument. If you want to go to the interior, I think there's some really good D tackles in the straps as well. You're going to get a chance to take all of them. You're going to get a chance to take, uh, <laughs> I mean, well, God, the Bears are up again at nine. And this is to me the one of the more sort of fascinating spots in the draft because you could really go in a bunch of different directions. Heck, you could go receiver if you wanted, right. even though they signed Keenan Allen to a one-year deal. But uh, with the big three on the board, I view, I, I, I see that as a pretty discreet tier for me. Uh, and there's a bit of a drop off there, so I would not go receiver then. So my needs, I've got a bunch um, of as po possibilities. You could go offensive line. The tackles are great. You could go edge here. You could go defensive tackle. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to give you two options. Perfect. And this is a tough one. I'm not going to lie. This, this is the hardest one. I'm going to go narrow it down really, to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very difficult. Who would have thought the Bears would be at a luxury pick situation with some of the additions they've made? Like, I know. I mean, this is, it's a good setup. Um. Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. I'm going to – the very different players, and one of them is probably going to surprise you, but I was talking about it with Dan Orlowski this morning. I'm going to put up Powers here <laughs> as an option. I don't right. think this is going to happen, but – Imagine. First of all, they have the new offensive coordinator, Shane Walder, and he loves 12 and 13 personnel. Right. We talk about a quarterback's best friend. Um, he's going to be the most fascinating. He dropped, uh, Greg, when I did this with Danny, Bowers just kept dropping, and it was like getting ridiculous because we were like, he's so <laughs> obviously going to be an amazing NFL player. But And then I put up a verse you talked about, um, really, really athletic edge rusher out of Florida state. I think this is still the, the bears have Montez swept, but they could use another young player to bookend. Who are you going to go? Man, it's a tough call. I, knowing where the bears are going uh, and what we did at number one, uh, I'm taking Brock Bowers. Uh, I just think we talk what? all the time about yards after the catch and being able to create on your own. Like there is not a guy in this draft that is even close to Brock Bowers. Like there's, I mean, while I think that there's good tight end depth in the draft, like there's some good players at tight end. There's no one that is as difficult to defend as Brock Bowers. And the league is all about matchups. I mean, it's all about, all right, how do I create matchups? How do I create matchups? Tell me what you do with Brock Bowers. There were times at Georgia, they wanted to hand it to him on stretch zone at running back. They'll get him on jet sweeps. They'll get him in one-on-ones where they play him at X. They'll play him in the slot. They'll motion him. Um, he's, he's just, he can do anything. 
out of the backfield or out as a traditional standalone wide receiver. So I think he's the most difficult guy to defend in the entire draft because of how many different positions he can play and what a nightmare it would be for defensive coordinators trying to substitute accordingly based on what he can do for you. Now, he's not going to give you anything in the run game uh, <laughs> and, and his run blocking. Yeah. He won't give you much there. He'll give you effort, but that's about it. Um, but he's a he's a versatile piece. And if you put him in like a Kyle Shanahan offense, my mind would explode. You know what I mean? Like, that's the type of player he is. Okay. I, um, the Jets, since my last taping, signed Tyron Smith to a one year deal. I don't care. I'm still going offensive line. I did, you know, it's a one year deal, first of all, but, but I, depth is so needed. Even with the improvements they've made across the line, they traded for, um, Morgan Moses with the Baltimore Ravens, who's going to be their starting right tackle. So I'm giving you two options, and one of them might be a little bit of a shocker to you. So Potanu, we've talked about, who's got great versatility, um, can play multiple positions. Some teams might view him as a guard. I think for the Jets, it really doesn't matter year one. And then I threw up a Marius Mitz out of Georgia. Uh, this is the one I he, – he's the one I think he could go anywhere in the first round, and I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, very small sample size, very talented and athletic player. Super talented, got hurt last year, and they missed him bad. Um, and it was noticeable drop off when he went out. And it's Georgia, you know. I mean, it just goes to show you, like they they have linemen coming off the conveyor belt, you know. So it's never been a noticeable issue if you're without a tackle. Like next guy up, no problem. But when he went out, it was like, all right, boy, bells and whistles going off. Like we're just not the same team. Um, so they're on the upside, knowing the Jets. I think they'd go Mims. Uh, I think Fatanu is a high ceiling Woo! player. I think he's a guard in time. I think he's really athletic, uh, but I think he's a guard. I don't think he projects as a tackle. So I would go Mims there, give him a year to kind of figure out and get his feet wet. And then when Tyron Smith retires or whenever he moves on, then you would you would go with Mims moving forward there. But just knowing the Jets, like they're going to take the upside guy that looks the part. That's just too, like as a former Jet, I know this. I I know the Stephen Hills. I know the Mackay Beckton's. Like I know where the Jets draft usually goes. So if, let's take the upside guy with limited pro productivity. But I do think Mims is a solid pick. Would be a shame if Fautanu dropped to my Seahawks at sixteen. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I have wavered a lot of, on whether to throw up JJ McCarthy here because. This is what the like going into this process. I was like, no way, I would take JJ McCarthy in the top fifteen. However, a lot of this has to do with the Vikings, the draft capital they've amassed, their timeline as a team, the fact that it would be an excellent situation, really an ideal situation for his skill set. So he is there. The Vikings also need cornerbacks, and so I bring back Terry and Arnold, who is my CB one in this class. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh, I think they'll go JJ McCarthy. Um, just That's what you would do? Would you do it? Yes, I probably okay. would. And, and to be honest with you, I think J.J. McCarthy is one of those guys that people can't quite figure out because, okay, well, he wasn't asked to do a lot. And there were very limited plays on tape in which you felt like he was throwing into a tight window. And But if you actually look at the skill set and the throws that he does pull off, I think he's that good. I mean, it's just just because he wasn't asked to do it doesn't mean he can't. You know what I mean? I think that's a difficult thing for people to project because there are there are occasional Aaron Thrones, but I mean, if you have to sit there for 25 minutes and, you know, you haven't thrown a ball in real time, you know, I mean, they went 42 straight snaps against Penn State without throwing a pass. Like, what if he had to go in and throw a third and, a third and seven to put the game on ice there at the end and he hadn't thrown the ball in two quarters? I mean, that's just kind of who they were. So I think it's difficult to play with great rhythm in that offense, and yet he did it. So, and when you looked at it, when he was asked to step up and make a play, he did, whether it was the tight window throw against Ohio State, uh, the game, the throw to the tight end at the national championship that broke the game open, uh, a layered throw early in the game in the national championship over the top left to right to the wide receiver, Roman Wilson. Like he can make yeah. the throw. So uh, I really like the fit here. I think it's a perfect fit for what Kevin O'Connell wants to be as well. So I think yeah. they actually. I think they get lucky that he falls this far to right, them. Right, and they would be thrilled. Right, exactly. Yeah, happen, yeah. like, that's what I would do. I, I might be, get an itchy trigger finger and like scoot up a couple picks and say, yeah, I'm going to go get my guy right now. I think, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they scoot up more than a couple of picks the way <laughs> these things are taking out. But yeah, for our for our draft, I agree. That's why, you know, I I would do it. I can say I would 
I've, I've come around the idea really because of, to the landing spot. Dan, and I talked about this, like if JJ McCarthy was on the Patriots, I would be very, very nervous <laughs> right. about his NFL career, but this is a dream spot for a quarterback. Perfect. Okay. So the Broncos also need a quarterback. I do not uh, think either. I would not put either two quarterbacks there. No. Uh, so I'm giving you uh, Terry and Arnold again and Jared verse um, both needs on this roster. Uh, you know, they need a, an outside corner to play opposite Sertan um edge is a need as well they have some young players who are pretty good i like baron browning a lot but i still think they need a, a top edge which of these two players would you take i would take jared verse uh i just think jared verse against the run uh he can fill i mean they just need some th- they need some help up front uh defensively and look i know that sertan's great i'm um, having the secondary corner that could lock you down is terrific especially in that division uh, knowing some of the teams that you'll face, but at the same time, man, like I got to have some guys along the defensive line too. And I look at some of the D tackles, I know we'll get to them, but th- this would be a spot where I start to think, all right, maybe one of those D tackles, maybe that's a spot where they come off too. whether it's Johnny Newton, Byron Murphy, those guys would kind of be top of mind. Just seeing what Aaron Donald did for so many years and him being fresh in our mind with how he retired and watching these highlights and these tributes over the last four days, like, you know, like, Oh my God, if I can find the next Aaron Donald, we are yeah. cooking with gas for the next decade. And I think Byron Murphy could be that. I really believe that. The Rams are at 19. Like, no one take Murphy. Please. No one take Murphy. <laughs> no one take Murphy. Right. Yeah, they're picking before them. We'll get to that. Um, I don't have defensive tackle as a need for the Raiders, who just signed Christian Wilkins to an ungodly amount of money. Um, <laughs> I think they need corner. So I threw up uh, Karrion Arnold is back up on the board. And I added another corner, Quinion Mitchell out of yeah. Toledo, who is a player who the more I, I, I'm not going to lie to you and pretend like I watched Toledo football during the regular season. Uh, <laughs> but his tape is really, really impressive, Greg. Very solid, good length. I would go Taron Arnold. Um, just no disrespect to the to the group of five player. I just know that Terry on Arnold's seen some dudes with horsepower. You know what I mean? And it's not that Toledo hasn't. If anything, in that league, ask Andrew Hawkins, like as a former Toledo mm-hmm. Rocket himself, mm-hmm. you know, in that league, you run into some wideouts with some juice, but you don't often run into wideouts with juice and length and strength and all these other things. So I think that Taron Arnold, we have seen that. We've seen him play well against teams like Texas. The other side, not so well against Texas, but he, I thought, held up pretty well. We've seen him go toe-to-toe with neighbors. We've seen him go toe-to-toe with some other guys as well. So uh, I would base it based on the competition, and and I think it's Taron Arnold there by a pretty wide margin. All right. Take Taron Arnold off the board. Uh, we're at the Saints. Um, so they just signed Chase Young to one-year deal. Opposite Cam Jordan, edge is still a need. Um, so I'm going to throw up an edge who I like a lot. I think you know who I'm going to put here. Latu. Latu. <laughs> uh, but I'm also going to put up a wide receiver, a different yeah. Thomas, because Michael Thomas is out. This is the first uh, first point where I'm adding Brian Thomas Jr., the uh, big speedster out of LSU, to the board. Which of these two players do you want? Yeah, right there I would take Liatu Latu. Um, he oh. just... He's so long, it's just, it's almost hard to wrap your head around. And I remember watching that defense too, man. They're aggressive. I mean, UCLA is really aggressive. Um, you just can't get hands on the guy. And he's and he's pretty relentless, man. I mean, he plays with a good motor. They play with good urgency on that side of the ball, man. I was a little worried about how he'd hold up if you ran it right at him. You know, usually a guy like that, that's kind of, he looks wiry, but he's not. He's 265. 270 so he doesn't look as big as he actually is he just looks so long but he looks like a speed rusher and it's just not really who he is he's kind of a tactician Uh, i think there's more in the tank too um for what he could become uh i just think liatu uh latu is a guy that's just so unique um but i was worried about how he would hold up against the run and i watched him against oregon state and i thought he actually held up pretty well and that's a really good you mentioned fuaga like they can get after you in the run game so uh, he held up well in that game their defense in general held up well in that game so uh i like a lot too there a lot yeah so polished i said the pass rusher i was so impressed i mean so many often with these guys i'm like okay what other moves do you have okay like do you have a plan what's your inside what's your counter and he just Really, you can you can drop him, and I think he can start immediately. Um, might not have to in New Orleans. Okay, so the the Colts, I'm giving you two corners, um, and I think this is an interesting because they need a corner. They mm-hmm. also you could go edge, you could go receiver, you could go safety. Um, actually, you could go safety, which brings up an interesting question. So I'm, I, I put Mitchell back on the board, but I'm adding Cooper DeGene, who's a player that I am absolutely in love with. Um, so I this is interesting for me because 
Mitchell, I think most teams might have higher on their boards because of the athletic traits, the man coverage abilities. Right. But Greg, DeGene might be a better fit for what Gus Bradley does with the Colts with their very zone heavy defense. Yeah. So which player are you going to go with here? I like Cooper DeGene, which is funny. And I also like what he can give you in the return game. He's a dynamic, super Ooh. dynamic guy with the ball in his hands. I think DeGene's got good length. Uh, he's super physical. I mean, anytime you come out of Iowa, you're playing the run. You know, I'm not saying he's Richard Sherman. He's not quite that long. And he's got a little bit more wiggle than Sherman. Uh, he got a little bit more twitch than Sherman. Not as instinctive as Sherman. Uh, nobody is. But I think he, he has a skill set that feels comparable in ways to what Richard Sherman was for so many years uh, and, and obviously tremendous success uh, in a defense that's comparable. So I like Cooper DeGene a lot for the fit. Uh, it's probably a touch high, but I also at the same time, like I see what you see and I appreciate that you see it too, because I really like this kid. I think he's fun to watch. I think he's a really good player. You know, what? The, the, the Sherman thing is so funny because the thing he has in common with him is I don't know how to articulate this, but it's almost like he has like this really good, sense of his own athleticism like he always clicks and close exactly the right time <laughs> and he you know what i mean like it's just yeah. perfect when he plays off he times everything so perfectly and he, he really he's just a really really smart player i'm a huge fan of him okay I, if i'm a cx i'm a huge fan of the way this board has shaken this draft is shaking out <laughs> right I, I swear i wasn't cheating you made the picks hey, because both works. byron murphy and Troy Fontano are on the board. And yeah. God, either of these players, I think, would be exceptional for Seattle. It'd be amazing. I'm going Murphy on the upside. Yeah. Uh, I think this guy is unbelievable. I can't believe he's not coming off in the top 10. Like, I know he doesn't check the measurable boxes, but haven't we learned by now? Like, haven't we learned like, <laughs> that just because a guy does not fit through the door like some of the great players before him doesn't mean he can't be a superstar and be a unicorn and unique? I get it. Like there's only guys, there's only so many under six foot quarterbacks. There's only so many five eleven, six foot, six one defensive tackles. It's only two hundred and ninety defensive tackles that are all time greats. I get it. I understand that. But there's just some guys that are just built different. And this guy is different, man. Like he is so strong. He's so slippery. I don't think you could touch him. He's like Quinn and Williams to me. A slightly shorter Quinn and Williams. But I watched him multiple times against against Washington. We we're calling the game. He did a double swim move. He swam the right guard. He swam the center and route to a quarterback hurry and a tipped ball. Like, the guy is ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I think he's relentless. His motor never stops. He comes from a great high school program in DeSoto. Went on and has kind of set the tone for a new era of Texas football. And the fact that I think you're getting him at 16 is an absolute steal. Like, he's up there alongside Dallas Turner. He's up there alongside Jared Verse. To me, I don't think there's a drop-off between the three. Like, if I could have those guys and then possibly Johnny Newton, I got a Pro Bowl defense blind. For pro Bowl defensive lineman for a really long time, I think. Yeah, it's the, I think Murphy versus Turner is going to be really because positional value comes into play there, which just the way this the reason why he's here is just because of the way um, this, this draft is sh sh shaken out, shaken out, right? Um, and just how offense heavy it is at the top because otherwise, I think it would go a lot higher. Um, okay, so we got the Jags. So you could go in two different directions. I put Brian Thomas Jr. back on the board. They did sign Gabe Davis, who's kind of in, a little bit similar, but uh, I view Thomas as a higher upside player. And then uh, I, I threw back Quinn Quinion Mitchell back on. Corner is another need for this Jags team, which these two players do you want. Yeah, I'll take Brian Thomas here. Just missing out on Calvin Ridley, Brian. Ridley, wanting the weapons. You know, that I think is necessary. Still have a young quarterback, a quarterback that's becoming a star and, you know, right before our eyes. But I don't think you're ever going to be upset by going to the well and adding pieces, especially a piece that's vertical like Brian Thomas can get behind the defense and has great juice. So I'm a little surprised he's elevated as quickly as he has. I, you know, I thought I thought this would be a spot where we'd start thinking about, you know, a you know, an AD Mitchell in that vicinity. But I'm a little surprised that Brian Thomas has surpassed him on a lot of boards. But but I kind of get it because the speed is outrageous, even though AD is super fast. I think AD's ability to play the ball in the air is better than Brian Thomas. And I think his ability to track the ball is better than Brian Thomas. A big play, a big moment is something that's better than Brian Thomas too. Granted, I mean, he Thomas wasn't the number one in his own team, so it's a tricky spot to be in. But yeah, this that would be a conversation that would be very difficult for me to have. Yeah, I well, you mentioned AD Mitchell. I've got him on my board for the Cincinnati <laughs> Bengals. I wrote it down before you said it. Um, right. Cincinnati Bengals, look, I think T. Higgins is going to play this year, but that'll probably be his last year as a right. Bengal. 
Uh, you know, they're going to play Jamar Chase. Uh, I just think the way this offense is built and um, the way they've approached it with Joe Burrow, it makes sense to continue investing receiver. However, Jonah Williams is gone. They definitely need tackle uh, a, a tackle. So I put Talia Fuaga from Oregon State up here. Where are you going to go? Uh, I'll go A.D. Mitchell here. I mean, he is T. Higgins. <laughs> like, I mean, we've already seen what happens when you put T. Higgins on that offense as the 1B receiver. I mean, it's a it's a no-brainer. It could not be a better situation for A.D. Mitchell to go into. And he's got a knack to be like that clutch guy. Like He's got that clutch gene where the bigger the moment, the bigger the play, the more likely he is to make the play. And if you look back at his games played in – national championship game in 21 game winning touchdown national uh, semifinal game against Ohio state in 22 game winning touchdown. Uh, you look at his performance against TCU in the national championship in 22 touchdown. That was of course at Georgia. Then you look at what he's done at Texas, a uh, big, huge game against Alabama in week two, the biggest game of the year for them. Like the guy is the guy is the star when the game's on the line, a big moment, got to have a situation. AD Mitchell's your guy in this draft for sure. Yeah, he's definitely one of my, like my guys. Like I think I'm higher on him. Maybe like at the at the combine, people were losing their mind because Worthy, you know, he broke the record. Yeah, I don't AD care. Mitchell at his <laughs> size, running as fast as he does. Right, that is meaningful. Like, I, I I love I I love Xavier Worthy, but he's like Hollywood Brown a little bit. Like yeah. I, you know, it's speed's great, but I, I kind of like six four two hundred. You know, games. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we got the Rams at 19. So you alluded to uh, Aaron Donald. So they do need defensive line depth. Um, but they did bring back Darius Williams from the Jags. Corner is also a need. So I, this is where I, I put up Jerzon Newton, Johnny Newton, uh, who is to me the second defensive tackle after Murphy. And then I, I brought back Queen and Mitchell. Yeah, I like Quinion Mitchell a lot. I'm still going Johnny Newton here. I, I watched Johnny Newton, and I look at the Big Ten West last year, and he played against some decent interior off of the blind, man. Like, he just wore people out. And Illinois didn't have a lot last year on defense. Relatively speaking, they lost quite a bit the year before. They had some veteran guys that were good. And this guy was like the all-points bulletin every week. And no one could block him. <laughs> he just, no one could block him. And he, you know, he wears a single digit too. So it kind of stands out. Your eyes are drawn to him a little bit. And he, I think he's the real deal. I, I, I think that the gap between him and Murphy is, there is a gap that exists there. But I think that you're not falling that far when you get the Newton. And I, I think you just, you lean D tackle here as opposed to corner. But it is a bit of a toss up in this spot. All right. So we got the Steelers. Um, I do think they need a wide receiver at 20 though, especially with Thomas and Mitchell off the board, not loving it for them. Corner is a different direction they could go in, but I'm going to give you two tackles. Uh, they need someone to protect either yeah. Russell Wilson or Justin Fields. They drafted Broderick Jones last year. We'll see what side they have in mind for him to play on. We brought back Fuaga and Fushanu. Who would you like? Uh, I'll take Fuaga here. I, it just feels a little bit more like the Steelers to me. If you look at Oregon state, they're very blue collar. Uh, their offensive line was their star. They look, they had good running backs. They had good, they had a good receiver. Uh, you know, quarterback was fine, but they're, I mean, they, they made offensive line cool. And Talisi Fuaga was a big reason why. I mean, if you watch him, like he's finishing plays, he's playing after the whistle. He flirts with a 15 yarder a couple times a game. Like it just feels like Pittsburgh and one that I think people will really appreciate up there. So I, if I'm the Miami Dolphins at 21, I am thrilled that some of these premier offensive linemen are still on the board. Again, we've got Fashanu, and then we've got Fautanu. Um, Tron Armstead is coming back, but you know that's always a question with injuries. Um, so I think you know th th there is kind of a question like, okay, wh what positions on the offensive line are we looking to fill, fill in Miami? Fatano gives you more of that positional flexibility, sure. but maybe you view Olu as the next Ron Arms or is his heir apparent. Which of these players would you rather have? I, I, this one, I'd probably go Olu Fashanu, and partly because I look at the offense and the style. You know, quick passing game, really smart. Yeah. I think putting a premium on athleticism, mm -hmm. and that's kind of who Olu is. Not that Fatano isn't. Like, Fatano is ex outstanding from an athletic standpoint. But I know too. Look, two has got some injury history. I want to make sure that, that right side is is buttoned up. And I think the best pl pass blocker between the two is definitely Olufashanu. So uh, that would be the direction I'd go here for Miami. 
So the Eagles love drafting offensive linemen. So I'm going to leave Fautanu on the board. And they had some, you know, I think guys are going to retire. Guys, guys have retired. Guys right. have moved on. Uh, but I also brought back Quinion Mitchell because uh, they do have older corners in Bradbury and Slay. And that is a position I think they, they do need to draft at. I think that's the understatement of the year. <laughs> There's secondary slight issue there. Yeah. Um, but I also look too at the Eagles, man, and I feel like the offensive line has kind of been their bell cow for a while. And and that's kind of been their calling card. Hey, they take great pride. Now we're the best group in the in the entire league, or at least if we're in the conversation for it. Uh so I think Fatanu here it makes a ton of sense. Um initial versatility like that. It's just so luck it's so typical. Is it like a Cowboys fan and a well play for the Jets? So like Cowboys Jets. It's like so typical that Fatanu would just fall to the Eagles, right? Like, of course, like, why wouldn't that happen? A guy that should be picked in the top 10, but because he doesn't have great length and we're not sure what position he projects at, like, he'll just fall to the Eagles and he'll be an eight time pro bowler in 13 years. No big deal. <laughs> okay. So, uh, really love this for the Minnesota Vikings, because as we discussed their other need outside a quarterback corner, and not only is Quinion Mitchell still on our board, yeah. uh, but so is Nate Wiggins. I threw him up again. This is Brian Flores' defense. Play a lot of man coverage. Actually, they it was kind of a weird defense last year. They played a lot of zone in Blitz a lot. It was like a very strange kind of interesting. Um, but it historically, has played a lot of man coverage. Uh, I think part of the reason they didn't because they didn't have corners. So I'm giving you two corners who I do think both can play man coverage. Uh, Wiggins and Mitchell. Which of the two would you like? Uh, I'll take this this time finally for Quinton Mitchell to come off the board. Sorry, right. Quinton. It's not we don't we love you. Great cover guy for sure. Uh, I do have a difficult time projecting a little bit G five to to NFL at corner in particular. Yeah. Just knowing, especially with the transfer portal being the way it is, we're just seeing less and less guys in the G five that are staying around for their entire college career. Usually, someone finds them, they throw a bunch of money at them, they go and play at the highest level. So we get real apples to apples comparisons. So this is a bit of a projection, but I think he's too good in coverage not to, to stay on the board here. I think it's a no-brainer. No so uh, the Cowboys are 24. I think offensive line is the biggest need on this team. I mentioned Tyron Smith moved on, obviously Tyler Smith, but you still have holes on this line. So I'm giving you two linemen who play different positions. Jackson Powers Johnson out of Oregon, who's a center. Tyler Bayadish also moved on. And JC Latham out of Alabama. Which of these players would you rather have? I, I'm going to go Jackson Powers Johnson. And I, I just look at, I think he's the best center by a mile. And I, I remember, you know, I remember, granted, it was like 15 years ago now, however long it was. I remember the Cowboys out of left field drafting Travis Frederick. We're all like, why the heck did you take him? Like, what are we doing? Yeah. And next thing you know, Travis Frederick ends up being like the best center in the league for the handful of years, you know? So uh, I like the value pick here to an extent. Um, I just think he's, I think he's really athletic. I think he's really smart. He'll take a lot of the pressure off of Dak with some of the calls. And look, Dak will still have the end of the day responsibility of getting it right and sorting the protections. But I think Jackson Power Johnson can handle that. They played at tempo and they almost never had issues. Never had issues for the most part with identifying protection and getting things sorted out. So I think Jackson Power Johnson is a really good pick right here. So I would go with, I would go with him as, as the best. I think he's by a pretty wide margin, the best center in the draft. He is such a funny like watch because I didn't pay attention to him at all during the regular season. I watched a lot of Oregon football. <laughs> and then I was walking, I watching Bucky Irving and uh, he's just such a scoundrel. I don't know. <laughs> like I, the word nasty is probably overused when you talk about, uh, interior offensive lineman, but he really is so nasty. He is. Out there. No, he's like filthy. And like, if you, watch, if you watch, if you watch him uh, in the Pac-12 title game, if there was a screen. I don't know if it was to Bucky or it might have been the other rack, whoever it was on the left sideline. And you just see his big barrel-chested body like sprinting full speed downfield, like exhausted. They score the next play. I think he like recovers the fumble or whatever, spikes it. Like I mean, no problem whatsoever. And then did like a dance into this camera. Like he's just. He just seems like a glue guy. Like, I want him in my locker room, so I'm all for it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't mind him for Seattle either, to be honest. Um, <laughs> 16 might be a little rich. Okay, 25. We're now, we're in, this is where it's getting real. Uh, the Packers, um, very good team is is one thing I'll say. Like, man, when I was looking at this roster, I, it's, it's really complete. So I could have them offensive line depth, um, really at multiple positions. And then corner. So I, I kept Latham on the board for you. They love yeah. drafting offensive linemen. Uh, and then I brought back uh, Nate Wiggins. You got a new op a defensive coordinator in Jeff Halfley. 
Um, scheme's going to be a little bit different. They brought in Xavier McKinney, which was a sign- probably my, one of my favorite fi- signings of the entire free agency scheme fit, everything. Uh, could you see them adding a corner here or do you think they'll go all in? Or what I, think, I think corner here makes a lot of sense. And I, I look at Wiggins and I remember doing some Clemson games and being like, man, this guy's is one of the better cover guys. Now Clemson's had some great defensive players, right? I mean, so many good ones in the last decade. And I remember kind of just being like, golly, are they, I don't remember them having a cover guy this good. That's just flat out in coverage, leave them on an island, call it a day. And they've had some good ones. And then I asked the coaching staff about, I was like, all right, so how does Nate kind of stack up with some of the guys you've had? And he's like, God's honest truth. No disrespect to the other guys that we've had. This is the best pure cover guy we've had at Clemson since we've been here. So over 15 years and countless draft picks, I mean, guys that, you know, went on and have had great NFL careers and that this guy has the best pure makeup of straight up coverage. I I think that's a good sign. Um, And I always listen to the coaches. You know, if the coaches tell me they know better than we do, (laughs) as much tape as we watch, like those coaches see it every day in practice too. So if they are going to rave that much about a guy, I'm going to take their word for it. So I'd go Wiggins there. Okay. Uh, we got the bucks at 26. Uh, I had as their biggest needs, I wrote interior offensive line and edge. And I think that aligns pretty nicely with a couple of players. Very Graham good. Barton out of Duke and chop Robinson is this is first time. Both of these players are showing up. Yeah. And I think this could be a spot too. Like I know Latham projects at tackle. Um, but it would not shock me like a little bit like DJ Fluker, you know, big, huge, physically gifted guy. Like I wouldn't be that shocked if he moved inside at some point in his career. Um, but I love Graham Barton. And when he, you kind of look at him, I'll go with him. Uh, I think Graham Barton's got a lot of good quality makeups. Like he's physical, that offensive line in general last year, when they were healthy, they were a handful. And, and he was, you know, the bell cow of the bunch. So I really like that group collectively and knowing that he stood out amongst a group that was overall very impressive, you know, kind of says all you need to know. So uh, I kind of go Graham Barton there. Cardinals at 27 could do so many things. Uh, really tackle their set at though. So uh, we will not bring back Latham. Um, they could go offense, defense, defense, all three levels. I'm giving you, I'm keeping chop on. They, they desperately need an edge rusher. And then I'm adding Kool-Aid McKinstry because they also desperately, they desperately need a lot of things. They need corner too. So what would you go? <laughs> I just tell me what they don't need, right? Yeah. I mean, uh-huh. Look, Dave Pash is like one of my best buddies and he's the voice of the Carlins. He goes, we always talk draft. And he's like, all right, well, it could be this, could be this, could be this, could be this, could be this. I'm like, hang on. That, that's like eight different positions. Yeah. Like, all right, are y'all that bad? I didn't yes. watch y'all that closely last year. Is it that bad? Um, all right. Well, I look at it and I would go with Chop Robinson in this situation. Um, I think he's got great juice. I always think, you know, all right, Penn State defensive lineman, like if I were to pass on him, am I passing Mm -hmm. on the next Micah Parsons, right? And I just think, look, I don't know why my mind goes there. He doesn't have quite the explosiveness or violence that Micah Parsons has, but he's got great speed. I do think that there are some some things that he could probably pick up as far as secondary moves, tertiary moves, things like that as you move down the list a bit. But I think he's got great speed and explosiveness, which is a great starting point, good first step. So, uh, you know, he'd be a guy that I'd be paying some close attention to. I just, I think they need to, he's going to need a little work, uh, but he could become a game-changing edge rusher. Yeah, he's like the upside guy to me. Um, okay, 28, Bills. Um, this is interesting because... Uh, Offensive line, quietly something that I think that they might need to uh, augment. I, so I was thinking more of the interior, but you mentioned Latham and his potential positional flexibility, so I'm bringing it back here. Uh, I do think that they could also use a fast receiver, so I brought in for the first time Troy Flank- Franklin pardon me, yeah. out of Oregon. I would go Latham here. Um, I think it's you're getting pretty good value. Um, I know, like like we talked about like it, he's a tackle in build and stature but i you know there were times last year we didn't play with great leverage and got beat with speed from time to time we got beat inside a few times too that was a little troubling you played the right side of bama so but i think too you know he was, he was pressing a little bit too and is and they're just you know he knew that the draft was coming and he's got great mobility for a guy that's as big as he is so i think when the pressure's off and he's just all right he's playing he's going to be he's going to be a really solid pro it's just i don't know what position it's going to be i don't see him as like a left tackle um 
I think he's going to be a right tackle or possible guard pro bowler. Like I, I think he can be that kind of guy. So um, might have to drop a little bit of weight and work on the flexibility a little bit. But for the most part, I think he's a really good player. Uh, and I think he's a good leader too. That, that I think is also paramount. And um, when you, you know, when you have a, a, a group that's playing for championships or hopeful championships every year, like Buffalo has been for the last handful of years, uh, you need guys that are steady and have played in big games and big moments. And, and he's definitely done that. So the Lions uh, signed Kevin Zeitler. Guard is not a need. I have corner, edge, receiver. Uh, so I'm give you a couple of interesting names who we haven't talked about. I'm putting up Keon Coleman mm. out of Florida State because they have, of course, Jameson Williams. They have Amon Ross St. Brown, who's going to get right. paid a lot of money soon. They don't have that big body prototypical X receiver. Uh, and then uh, they also need edge, I think. So I put up Darius Robinson out of Mizzou, who's a very divisive prospect. I'm learning for the first time, but I, but he is my next edge looking at my board. So I've got him up. I, I do like Darius Robinson. I would go Keon Coleman here. Um, Fun. I, think, I think Keon Coleman's really good. And I think there's still a lot of really good value picks at wide receiver that we haven't even talked about yet, really. I mean, I think Troy Franklin, Ricky Pearsall, like I think there's a bunch of really good wide receivers that... Bad. That are coming up, but for whatever reason, though, I'm just trying to figure out like, do people just not watch Keon Coleman just completely dominate LSU? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know LSU's defense, as we found as the year went on, just not great. But man, when he was healthy, which was early in the year, I mean, he was untouchable. I mean, yards after catch was through the roof. He's got a huge, huge frame, big body. I think he's effortless and really smooth at, at that size. So, uh, I love Keon Coleman, so I'm glad he's coming off the board in the first round because there haven't been many mocks I've seen where he's in the mix. Yeah, uh, he, he, I said uh, Robinson was divisive. He seems to be equally divisive. Right. I think I don't know something about like contested catch guy. I don't know. There's such a right now. Um, I feel like a premium on separation in the yeah. NFL and openness, and I think that's probably scared teams. But they have guys who can. I mean, I I like it for this team in particular, and. It is a team that certainly zags. Um, okay, mm. so we got the Baltimore Ravens. We're, we're almost done. And this is tricky because... It's whoever you know, the best available is. Go with them. And they just... It's like uh, never yeah. made, never fair. It never changes. Like, oh my gosh, the Ravens won the draft again. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it's tricky though because, yeah, it's best available. They do have such a need at guard. And I'm not sure... Although, you know, and so tackle, they're better situated. So I'm like, should I put a tackle on the board here? There's players like corner is a need. Okay, so I'm going to put McKinstry back on the board. I don't know if he's your next corner, but he's mine. And then I'll, I'm going to put Tyler Guyton out of Oklahoma here. You, I like it. I'll probably go McKinstry here. Um, I, obviously, you're, it's a luxury pick. I think McKinstry had some moments last year where he kind of spaced out. You know, there were some things where like it just they yeah. they didn't get things communicated and for whatever reason it just didn't really work out. But I you just there's so many first of all, it's the Ravens. So I always think they're going like Bama. I always think they're going SEC. Like I just just feels <laughs> like that's that's the direction they end up going. It's like Bama LSU, their best player will be on a Ravens next year, whatever it is. So I, I think it's a it's a safe bet just based on the pedigree where they'd go there. But I also think too with with Kool-Aid, when you put them in a structured environment like that. I think you're going to get the best out of him. Um, but there are some moments that are a little bit infuriating when you watch the tape. It's like, okay, well, why didn't you pass that off? Why didn't you make the adjustment check with the safety? Why did you do this or do that? I mean, you watched the Texas game last year is really an underwhelming performance. But then you watch him later in the year, it's like, dude, he's playing his tail off. You know what I mean? And just the ups and downs were frustrating. I feel like Harbaugh and company, they seem to always get the best out of their guys. So I'd be really optimistic for him going to a situation like this. And um, I think it'd be a great fit too, because it feels like good value for the Ravens too. Okay. So uh, the Niners are 31. I have offensive line corner receiver. We'll see what happens with Brandon Ayuk, but I'm going to go with those first two positions, put Kyler Guyton back up uh, offensive line quietly. Just, I mean, they, they brought back the kibitz, but uh, who was kind of like the, the Niners fans are obsessed with hating on him. Uh, they do need to continue to draft there. And then this is a little bit of a curveball because I don't, I haven't seen him. Maybe I've missed it, but uh, I put Mike Sandra still out of Michigan, who is a player I absolutely love. First round 
maybe a little bit rich, but this yeah. is a team that can draft for need, and I do feel that he feels a need for them. I think they probably go Guyton, and, and uh, Guyton just has a little bit more predictable projection. Like with Sane Rastill, I love him. Like he's a playmaker. Like that guy makes plays, and he's a defensive back. I'm not going to compare him to the Badger. That'd be unfair. You know, we're talking about an all-time great, but he's got some Badger qualities. You know what I mean? Where for whatever reason, the ball just seems to always find that guy, and he always seems to make a play when the play's there to be made, and the ball is just, you know, tipped through the air, and it's boom. And the last guy I saw like that was Kyle Hamilton, and but he was an easier projection because he was, you know, he looked like God's gift to football as he got off the bus. I mean, six four and ran like the wind and was just a thing of beauty, like an Adonis out there on the field. Um, but I just, I think that, that same still just doesn't really check all the measurable boxes, former receiver. Like there are just some things and there's some stuff that just needs to be kind of figured out. Uh, and I think he's kind of a nickel guy almost exclusively. So love the idea. I think Guyton there would be a little bit easier to project here at the end of the first. So for the final pick, uh, I'm going to. This is another one. I'm going to put one of the players who I ended up choosing. La we went with last time, which I, this is a curveball too. And this, I might be biased here. <laughs> it's the Chiefs who uh, they did add Hollywood Brown. I still think they need to add a receiver. They could also go tackle and I would not. And the BYU kid is here. There, there's options, but I'm going to put two receivers back on the board. Love it. I'm going to put Troy Franklin. No one took him, right? <laughs> He's still there. And then, this is my bias pick. Yes, very much so. But how sick would he be? He's awesome. I, I mean, I love Jalen Polk. It'd be an unbelievable situation for him to go into. Um, if I were coming out of college, I'd be bending over backwards to try to get on the Chiefs because you're going to get some passes. And you just saw how they just brought along Rasheed Rice so well last year. You know, it just like just it, it was ugly early, but it just kind of got a little better. And a you, little you don't better. like drops? I got a guy who will not drop the football. He does not drop the ball, and he's he's got great vertical speed. And I thought last year. Um, Jalen McMillan getting hurt allowed him to really step up. I'm going Troy Franklin. <laughs> okay. No, it's correct. Okay. I'm sorry. I, yeah, it's, just it's the yards after catch stuff. You know, I mean, I just think, look, it, it'd be great. I love Jalen Polk. I think he's going to be a good player. He comes from Lufkin, Texas. He's got, that's a great high school program. Um, same high school program as Des Bryant. Like, like they love football there. He's a grinder. He's a super competitor. This is a little bit too high for him, though. I think Troy Franklin, though, is. I can see him as a late first, early second type of guy. Yeah, no, that would be awesome as well. Um, I feel like this was a really good draft. <laughs> I feel like everybody is going to be totally happy, and nobody in the comments is going to be angry about what their team did. You guys are all going to love it. No, that, that uh, always happens, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, please, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave comments letting us know what you would have done. Uh, you should also definitely subscribe to Greg's truly excellent podcast, Always College Football. It is a must listen. Um, even though it won't be as fun for me next year with my Washington Huskies, but I will still listen. Greg, thank you so much for coming on. This was an amazing treat. I really appreciate it. Uh, you're the best, Mina. Thanks again for having me.